Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your amazing love for us, God. We thank you for your presence. We know that you are here because you have promised to be here. And so, Father, I pray as we open up your word, as we, um, uh, as we engage with you this morning in, um, uh, in this time, I, won't you just come and speak to our hearts? Come and, and uh, um, move in this place. Pour out, your, uh, pour out your spirit upon us that we might understand, that we might be transformed, that we might be drawn to your heart this morning, God. And, um, and know what we ought to do. Um, we, uh, we are desperate to be in your presence, God. And so we just invite you to come. Be in this place. And we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Do you ever, uh, do you ever read the amazing stories uh, in the scriptures and just wish that God would do something like that in your life? You know, wouldn't it be, you know, it'd be so cool. I, um, I love doing that. There's so many great stories in Scripture. We just, uh, 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 just a little while ago, we were talking about Jonah and what an amazing, uh, what an amazing story that is. Not only, I mean, there's the, the obvious, the headline story, a guy got swallowed by a whale and lived to tell about it. But, uh, but then, you know, the amazing nature of of the message that he delivered to Nineveh and the, and the, and the, uh, the response. I mean, it was so amazing. And, and you might think, you know, if, if, uh, if God did something like that uh, among us, you know, of course people would respond to it. The catch is you must be willing to be swallowed by a whale. So that's a thing, you know. Um, I think about the story, one of my favorite stories, uh, most, I can't believe nobody's made a movie about this yet, is the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel and, and all that, um, you know, all the things that happened there is against the, the, the priests of Baal and all the stuff that was going, I mean, what an amazing story. Um, and, uh, um, you know, fire coming from heaven and devouring the, this, this uh, sacrifice that had just been soaked with so much water and and the fire not only burned the sacrifice but it burned the stones that the sacrifice was uh w this altar was built with and 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 all the people just was like yes god is our god and and we man if god would do something like that in our day of course you know of course people would respond everybody would get saved or, you know, I think of the te temple when it was dedicated. Solomon built the, t the temple, and, and it was just amazing. It was breathtaking. There was nothing like it in all the world. And, and the people came from all over Israel to the dedication of this temple. And, and while they're all standing there, the presence of God comes in this big, dark cloud. And, and it, all, it goes into the temple, and everybody sees this happening. It was this very dramatic event. And we think, wow, if something like that were to happen in our day. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, all the people would just, like everybody would be saved. Everybody would believe. I think, and the, you know, the, the, the New Testament, in the New Testament, so many great stories of Jesus' healings, you know, and... and Jesus would heal somebody, and everyone that would witness this healing would just be amazed. And the crowds would just, they just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And everybody's following Jesus all over the place. And remember, Jesus feeds 5,000 people. Do you think word of that maybe got around? Right? 5,000 people that Jesus fed with, with nothing. I mean, with just these, uh, just a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish, and everybody's just having this feast, and it's just this amazing miracle. But if something like that happened, wouldn't it, wouldn't it just be amazing? People would, people would come out of the woodwork and be saved. And, and there was this uh, time when Paul, um, was, he, was, he was in this, this town and there was this uh, young girl who uh, had a, 
had an evil spirit in her that allowed her to um, divine things. She was a fortune teller, and, and she was actually a slave. And because of this situation with the demon, that the person who owned her was making a lot of money. And, um, and so Paul is in this town, and he's preaching, and this girl that has the demon in her, is the, it's kind of the weirdest thing. She just keeps ca- telling. She's like talking in the middle of these crowds. She just kept s- saying, this is Paul. He's telling you about how, you know, salvation in Jesus. And, and to the point where Paul, he's dr- she's just driving Paul up a wall. He's so annoyed by this. Um, I, you know, and, and so he just... He just stops and he casts out her demons in front of all of these people that see this. And, um, uh, of course, it makes the, her owner pretty angry because now he's lost his livelihood. Uh, he can't use her for this uh, purpose anymore. But all these people that witnessed this power event, it just, it just was an amazing moment. And we think, wow, if we, something like that happened, everybody would just be so like, drawn to that, right? Everybody would, would surely believe. Or Peter, um, you know, Peter was preaching in the temple and the authorities didn't like it. And uh, it was getting, the, the, the heat was going up in Jerusalem, you know, and Peter gets thrown in jail, and the church is really worried, like, what's going to happen? You know, some, some of the apostles actually, are, are in, and some of the church leaders are, 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 have been martyred. And nobody knows what's going to happen. In the middle of the night, and Peter's in his jail, middle of the night, an angel shows up. And there's like this angelic jailbreak. And um, Peter um, gets up and just follows the angel out of the prison. You know, the, the chains just miraculously fall off his arms and the doors just open for them, you know, like, like, in, like in the movies. Just open for them, right? And all the way out of the jail and then the angel just leaves and Peter, it's, uh, uh, Peter goes, goes home and knocks on the door and a, a girl answers or goes to the door and, and looks out, and it's Peter, and she's, she's so like, she's so surprised by it, she doesn't even open the door. She just runs into the house and tells everybody else she's yelling and screaming. They're like, we'll open the door for him, you know, and, and all this, and, and, you know, everybody saw that, and they were in awe, like an angel did this, and I mean, could you imagine if that happened now? Like, people, how people would respond to that? There was the time that Paul was, was preaching, and, and he didn't know, he didn't, he, he didn't think he'd ever be back to this church, and so he was just like, I'm going to give it all to you. And, and he just preached and preached and preached. He preached so long that this kid who was there listening, and he was sitting in this window, fell asleep, and he fell out the window onto the street below, and the Bible says he fell down as if dead. That's a long sermon. I mean, I've heard you guys, um, if that's going to happen around here, I'm going to have to preach a long sermon, and we're going to need to get more windows. (laughs) Just saying, you know. (laughs) And Paul goes outside, and, and this kid just wakes up. And everything's fine. And everybody goes upstairs for some more preaching. What if that happened in our day, you know? <laughs> um, uh, I don't know maybe, maybe not so much preaching, but, you know, somebody, somebody falling like that and, and being healed. If, you know, sometimes we say if we could just have stuff like this in our day, then people, people would believe. If God would just renew this, this, this proof of his existence and his power and his authority in our time. Well, um, I don't know. Here's the thing.
He does. He does. But um, we, we, tend to, we tend to still, even in our day, doubt. We tend to, um, I don't know, we tend to, to think, um, we tend to think things <laughs> of it that we, we try to file it away in our mind and in our heart in some way. I um, um, learned just this uh, last um, week of, of a friend of mine who had a miracle that happened in their family. And, um, um, and, and I would, I mean, I mean, legitimate miracle where uh, a young boy was very, very seriously wounded. And um, after, after much prayer and much heartache and much sobbing and, and tears over it, the Lord acted, and this young boy was healed in a, in a miraculous way, um, a verifiable way even. And... Um, we might stand in awe of that, but our own, our own thoughts and our own heart looks into that and we think about it and we say, well, maybe there's a reasonable explanation. Why is it that we do that? Why is it that we hope for miracles and then doubt them when they happen? Why is it that we hope for God to move and act and, and do what He only can do and then when he does, we kind of, we just want to explain it away. And, and yet we call, God, wouldn't you renew your, your acts of power and, and miracles in our day? It's kind of funny how we are and, and um, how, we, how we do that. Um. And at the end of the day, here's, here's really, here's really the, the problem. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. I am um, I'm amazed at how often that headline gets buried in in all of our conversation, our spiritual conversations, people come to me. I've, I've, I've had so many conversations with people about their objections with things. I've mentioned things like this before, and we talked about, you know, like I said, we talked about Jonah, and people have, so like, do you really believe that Jonah story? I mean, swallowed by a whale, please. And, or, or the story in, in Daniel of the three Hebrew children who were, Put in the fiery furnace, and and um, they were not burned by the fire. Miracle happened that day. Really, do you really believe that? There are people who who question um, the Exodus altogether. You know, did the the Hebrews really were in Egypt, and they, you know God brought them out, and all this stuff. I mean, that's a pretty made up story, isn't it? Is there any evidence, any proof of that? And um, twelve, you know, ten ten plagues, and and you know, all these things that um, are, are in the scriptures. Did God really do all of this? And um, we might spend a lot of time and energy and effort trying to explain all that away when all this does is really bury the headline. Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead... Um, it really doesn't matter what happened to Jonah. I mean, Jonah, Jonah died. I mean, whether he got swallowed by a whale or not is really kind of, it's old news. It really kind of doesn't matter if Jesus rose from the dead. And, and all of the, see, the fact of the matter is there's, there's, all, this, um, there's all this evidence, everything uh, everything in the scriptures and still everything in our life really points to this one event that is central to all of history, that Jesus 
rose from the dead. This is his works that are renewed in us in our days. Jesus rose from the dead. It is an undisputable fact, historical fact. It is an event that happened. And there's all kinds of evidence of that event. As a matter of fact, there's no other event in all of ancient history that is more venerated than this thing. This resurrection from the dead. This is what it's all about. Um, I hope it's that event that brought you here today. Because there's nothing bigger. There's no better. I don't know what you're. I don't know what you're expecting. Like something you know bigger than that's going to happen at church today. That's the reason we're here, right? Because of this historical event that happened. The truth is that sometimes we're uh, the ones that are requiring more than we have already for belief. We want more. We may believe that God did, but do we believe that he does and that God will do um, or are we convinced because Jesus rose from the dead that um, that it is enough that God is uh, you know we don't need any more for ourselves we don't need any more convincing that God can do exactly what he has said he can do And so we don't need to explain anything away. We don't need to, um, we don't need to, (laughs) we don't need God to prove himself over and over and over. We're convinced and therefore we have eyes that look a little bit differently at things. Rather than, um, rather than looking for God to do something in our life in order to prove to us that he can do We ought to be looking for what God is doing. Not to prove himself to us, but uh, to, um, in, in order that the world around us might come to know him and might be saved. Today we're going to be looking at a portion of scripture I think that is one of the most um, you know it's it's an amazing passage in scripture it's Acts chapter 2 if you have your Bibles turn to Acts chapter 2 we're also going to have these verses up on the screen but um, but it's always good to follow along in your Bible if you have it I would always encourage you to use that Um, this is a it's kind of a long uh, passage of scripture today and and we're not going to be um, we're not going to be getting into a lot of the details of this passage. Actually, what I want to do today is look at the big picture of this passage, and um, so that we might understand. We're going to be doing that a lot, actually. We might understand um, what is what is really going on here. Oftentimes, we we think of this as like Peter's sermon. Um, on the day of Pentecost. And um, here's what you need to know. I knew today was going to happen. I've known it for a long time. It's been on my calendar for months, and um, I have worked on a message (laughs) for today. I figured if Jesus didn't come back, I'd probably be preaching today. (laughs) Makes sense, right? I hope. Peter, on the other hand, had no idea the day of Pentecost was coming. He didn't know on on Saturday, he didn't know that tomorrow he was going to be preaching one of the most famous messages that would ever be preached in all of history. He had no idea. He didn't have any notes. Um, he uh, He hadn't prepped anything. They didn't even get a band, you guys. There was no band on the day of Pentecost. This is crazy, right? What evangelist would do this without a band, right? What would Billy Graham say? Sorry, that was... 
Um, this, this was a move of the Holy Spirit. It was not a move of the apostles. The apostles were just trying to do what they were told. They were staying together in Jerusalem and praying. That's all they knew what to do. They were super confused. They went fishing every now and then, I'm sure. But, um, but they were just pretty much staying together and praying and waiting. And then the day of Pentecost. So I'm starting in chapter 2 and verse 14. Okay, here we go. It says, but Peter, standing with the 11, I, I should give you a little bit of this. The Holy Spirit, has, we're, we're, I'm skipping this part. Um, I'll just explain it to you. The Holy Spirit shows up, moves in the room. There's this sound of this mighty rushing wind. And um, when the Holy Spirit shows up, there's fire. Um, that divide, like tongues of fire divide and go over the disciples' heads and they begin to speak in different languages. They're all, they're in the upper room. Now they're not, here's, here's what you're not, here's what you shouldn't be seeing in your mind. They've all like spread out around Jerusalem and they've gotten on their stages and with their pulpits and all this. And, and they are you know, ready for the Holy Spirit to do this thing. And the Holy Spirit comes. And so they start preaching the gospel in a bunch of different languages all around Jerusalem. So all the people who are there on the day of Pentecost can hear the gospel in their own language. That's not what is happening. Because they didn't expect any of this to be going on. They're all together praying in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit comes, and they go. They start. Um, they start speaking in different languages that they have never learned, and they don't know how they're doing this, and they don't know why they're doing this. But everyone outside, and there's a lot of cro- there's big crowds in Jerusalem. It's Pentecost is one of the the three big festivals that if you're a Jew, you go to Jerusalem for. It's in the law. You have to go there. And, and uh, Passover is one, and, and now this is the second one. This is Pentecost. It's, Pentecost is literally 50 days after Passover. So Jerusalem is just jam-packed with Jews. They're just from all over the world. Scripture tells us that they've come from all over. And, and now the disciples, 120 of them, in this upper room that are all together, they start, um, they're worshiping. They're having this prayer and worship, and people outside can understand what's going on. They can hear what's happening, but they hear it in the language that they understand. And, and, um, and it's a, Scripture tells us that they're proclaiming the, the great works of God. And so they're they're attracted to this, and it causes a crowd to be tract- attracted around this place. So that's what's going on, and some people are scoffing at it. Some people are, are um, you know, kind of pointing fingers and saying that these guys are, because they, maybe they don't understand what everybody's saying, and they're like, these guys are drunk. Now, they don't, they, they don't say that. I don't believe they say that because they believe these guys are actually drunk. I, I believe that they're saying that just because they are, um, uh, they're just casting derision. You know, it's like somebody might say to, you know, about somebody else, well, you're just crazy. Well, you don't really believe that person is crazy. It's just a way to cast derision on someone. So Peter um, wants to address this crowd that his gathered around this, the 120 disciples in order to explain to them what is happening. And I think it was actually kind of helpful maybe to some of the 120 too who were going, I don't know, what is happening? And so this, so this is what Peter's doing. So in verse 14 it says, but Peter, standing with the 11, lifted his voice and addressed them He says, men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. It's morning, right? It's uh, it's early. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. 
And now what he's going to do is he's going, this is the, the only scriptures that they have are what we consider the Old Testament scriptures, right? So now Peter, because he knows Joel, is going to share it with this, this, the people. And he quotes Joel, this is right out of your Bible, Joel chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 28. But it's also Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and following. And he says, In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I'm going to stop there for just a second. If you're a Jew in this day, in this town, here's what is normal. The Holy Spirit does not get poured out on all flesh normally. All throughout the Old Testament, it gets poured out on very specific flesh for a very specific reason at a very specific time. It's not this general thing. There are a few people in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit is poured out on. And uh, uh, namely, prophets, that's pretty typical. We read all the prophets in the Old Testament, and we read of the prophets in the Old Testament, and the Holy Spirit is given to the prophets, and they speak God's word. And it's not this general thing that happens. It's a very specific thing that happens at a very specific time for a very specific purpose. Every now and then, some kings receive a, a, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Saul was the first king of Israel, and he, and he prophesied. Um, when, when Samuel told him that he was going to be king, that God was anointing him king, he told them that he was going to be anointed with the Holy Spirit and that he would prophesy, and he did. And that was a sign to him. And, um, and, then, and David was a prophet. He, uh, he prophesied not only as a king, but in, in the book of Psalms. He wrote many, many psalms. And, and many of his psalms are prophetic about the Messiah. And so, um, so there were prophets and there were kings and, and, um, and priests uh, often would receive the Holy Spirit. And, and, um, and so, but it was a very specific thing. And so if you, were, uh, if you were a Jew, that is what you saw as the normal. That, that's, that's the, you don't have an expectation that the Holy Spirit would be given to you. The Holy Spirit was reserved for, for very special people at very special times for very specific reasons. But Joel, back in his day, gave this prophecy. And it was a confusing prophecy because it was so outside the norm of things. And it says, like, my, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And people would read that and they would think, what does this mean? What would that even look like? That, is that even possible? What do you mean by all flesh? You know, does, I mean, like, like all the Jews? <laughs> is what they would have thought. Because um, there, was, there was absolutely no thought at that point that the Holy Spirit could be poured out on someone who was not a Jew. And so here's Peter on the day of Pentecost. He's saying that what you're seeing right in front of you is a fulfillment of the Scriptures. That um, God said, I'll pour out my Spirit on all flesh. And then he goes and he, and he keeps going, keeps uh, quoting Joel. He says, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your little ones and your young men shall see visions. It got a little older. And your old men shall dream dreams. What he's saying, uh, Joel, what Joel is doing here, he's saying from the young to the old. All the, the young get this, the Holy Spirit poured out on them. The old get the Holy Spirit poured out on them. Then, then he says this, even on my male servants and my female servants in those days. Now he's talking about social standing. He's like, it's not just for the, it's not just for the, high, the priests and the prophets and the kings. All the way down to the servants, the lowly servants. When he says all flesh, he means all flesh. 
Even on the male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And I will show. And then he goes on and changes gears a little bit about nature all around. He says, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below. Blood, fire, uh, and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes. The great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, Joel is giving this prophecy, and he is talking about the, uh, like the last days in this prophecy. And um, like oftentimes happens in prophecy, there is a, um, um, there is a, a prophecy can span a great amount of time. Jesus, went, um, uh, at the beginning of his ministry, goes into the, the, the synagogue and, and he he's goes to read and he turns to the book of Isaiah and he begins to read and he says, the, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to, um, uh, to, to bind up the, the brokenhearted and to, uh, you know, and he, and he makes this prophecy. But then Jesus, if you read that, Jesus stops right in the middle of a sentence. He just stops and sits down. And he says, today in your hearing, this has been fulfilled. And everybody's really incensed by it because they know exactly what he's saying. He actually claimed in that statement to be the Messiah. But he stops right in the middle of the sentence because the rest of the sentence talks about something that isn't going to happen until his second coming. So this one prophecy spans all of the rest of time. And Joel is doing the same thing. Joel is saying, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all these. And then there's this, there's this gap between 18 and 19. And there's things that he talks about that are going to happen at the end of the end. So basically, what, what Joel is saying and what Peter is saying is, oh, here on the day of Pentecost, hey, guess what, guys? We are now in the end. These are the last days that, this, that the prophets talked about. We're in them right now. And they're start. Now, it's not a, uh, we think of it as kind of like the end, like this, like this line that history is barreling toward, this line. And someday we're finally going to cross that line. What, what it is more like is this, uh, at, at this point in time, it's more like a parallel line that, that history has kind of come up to this parallel line and we're running parallel with it to the end. And Jesus, uh, one day it is going to be consummated. We tend to think more linear than that, but, um, but you know, that's what's going on here. And so Peter is turning to this crowd and essentially telling this crowd that, hey, the we have made a change. We've shifted gears. This, we are in the latter days now. And God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh. And, and um, their ears would just be, be turned toward that. Like, whoa. It's, it's, we, we can clearly see that something is happening here. And Peter explains it to them. But then he goes on. He says, addresses him in verse 22. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God. Remember, uh, three different occasions, a voice from heaven spoke. It is baptism with John the Baptist. And though it was not public, with Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, and then in public, in Jerusalem, God, a voice from heaven said, uh, of Jesus, this is my son. That was, that was public. People heard this and word got around. Men, uh, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. All of these people who are in town for, uh, for uh, Pentecost were in town most of them for Passover, when Jesus was there doing miracles and, and all of these things. They were witnesses of these things uh, that he did in their midst. 
as you yourselves know. In verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says, and then Paul or Peter quotes David in Psalm chapter Psalm 16. He quotes him and and he says in starting this is Psalm 16 starting verse 8. He says this. I saw the Lord always before me. This is David prophesying by the Spirit. I saw the Lord always before me for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades. In the Old Testament, if you read it in Psalms, it doesn't say it's the grave. The idea is, um, uh, you know, Hades is kind of a, a, a Greek translation um, for, for death, but it just, means, it just means literally death. For you will not abandon my soul to death or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Now, if we, if, if we or the Jews took a literal view of that, we would be saying David has been promised by God that though he might die, that he will not, his body, his physical body won't see corruption. In other words, it won't decay. But everyone knows that's not true. Otherwise, we would be able to go to Israel and go to find a tomb of David where David's body would be lying in state completely intact. But that is not the case. As it was not the case in this day, and this is what Peter points out. He says, uh, brothers, I may say to you with confidence, and this is almost, it's, it's almost funny. I don't know if anybody laughed, but uh, he's almost being sarcastic. I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died, everybody already knew that, and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Everybody's like, yeah, we're clear on that. We're clear on that. Happened a thousand years ago. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on this throne or on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ as the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. What he's saying is the 11, the, the people, and, and the 120, all these people who are part of this, uh, of this day, all these, this commotion that's going on, what they are saying is we are all witnesses of this fact. We saw it with our own eyes. And, and you know, two people, two people are all it takes to have enough witnesses for something to be established as fact. And, and Peter is here saying, we are all, all 120 of us, we are witnesses of this truth. Verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Let all the house of Israel Therefore, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Wow, what a moment. And this, is, this, is not a, this is not a sermon that, that Paul had written out. Paul had, had you know, prepared all these remarks. This was just uh, Paul being led by the Holy Spirit, speaking to 
these people who knew what uh, who knew the same word uh, uh, of God, the same scriptures that Peter knew, but Peter had uh, had uh, was witness of something that they were not witness of. And so Peter was sharing all these things in light of these scriptures and illuminating to them the truth of these prophecies that had been fulfilled in this place in just these last, uh, last days, just the last couple of months for him. And the people heard these things, and it was amazing, their response to it. Is now in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? I think it's fascinating in scriptures, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, even in Joel, it, Joel says, don't tear your clothes. That's what they would normally do. You know, when, when something terrible would happen, when they're going to mourning or, or maybe it, they, they realize their own sin or something like that, they would tear their clothes as a sign of this mourning, as a sign of this problem. And so they would tear their clothes. And God says, stop tearing your clothes. Tear your heart instead. It's not your clothes that need to be torn. It's your heart that needs to be torn. And right here... Here, here it happens. Now they heard this and they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them these words, these such famous words, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What an amazing thing to say. No one, I'm telling you, no one in this crowd expected Peter to say anything remotely like that. What they just heard was the Messiah came and you all missed the whole thing. And not only that, you were in the crowd training, crucify him. You put him on the cross. You killed the Messiah. And they, they are all realizing the gravity of this situation. And you, I don't know if we can understand this sheer panic and devastation that they were feeling in this moment, being cut to the heart. And they say, what are we going to do? Oh, we're toast. <laughs> I mean, we're toast. We killed God. We killed his Messiah. Moses told us to listen to him. And we killed him instead. What do we do? What hope is there for us? And the answer that Peter gives, repent and be baptized every single one of you and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That answer doesn't even make sense. Where's the justice in that? Where's the, you know, the, basically, Peter is saying, God is not going to hold a grudge. All you need to do is change your mind. Come to Jesus. There's forgiveness. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He will put his spirit in you. He's willing, even right now. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he goes on, he says, for the promise is for you, and it is for your children, and it is for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. When he says far off, he's not talking about distance. He's not talking about the people you left back at home, you know, the people in Rome or the people in Spain or the people, you know, in far off lands. He's not talking about that. He's talking about in distance time. The, your children, and he could, just, he could have said it this way, your children and their 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 children. The, this promise is for all. It's for everyone. 
Scripture, uh, Luke, as Luke finishes this, this part of the passage, he just kind of gives some kind of summation statements. He's saying, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his words were baptized. And get this, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. That's a pretty big deal. Obviously, you know, this, this, this part of the conversation was only a small part of it. When he says many other things were said, many other things were said. And, and we don't have them all. And, and here's, here's the thing. If the Holy Spirit didn't include them, it's okay. We didn't need them all. This is what we needed. I don't know, um, when, I, when I read this last passage, actually, I'm... Uh, I, I, I was kind of curious about this, you know, on a, on a typical, that time, you know, back, back in those days, on a, on a typical Pentecost, um, how many people would we expect to, to flood into Jerusalem? You know, it would have been like 10,000 people coming and um, I mean, more than that, I mean, it was, like I said earlier, it was law. It was, you were, you were required. If you were a male, an adult male in, in, a, in a Jew, you were required to make this pilgrimage, this trip. Didn't matter where you lived. You made this trip. You were in Jerusalem for Pentecost. It wouldn't have been 10,000. It wouldn't have been twenty or 30,000 people flooding into Jerusalem. It would have been tens of thousands, maybe even a 100,000 people. The communities all around Jerusalem would be glutted with people. There would have just been people everywhere. And that, so that, that time, uh, you know, God saw to this, that all these people would be here for this day. The nation would be gathered for this move of God. And 3,000 people on that day were baptized into Jesus. Now, I don't say that as a, like, I'm not trying to be a downer here, saying that, you know, like, only, like, like that's a, like that's a small thing. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't like a huge percentage of the people who had come to Jerusalem for this festival. It was, uh, it was maybe just the people who could hear in, in that area. And, and, what, and to tell you the truth, I mean, I, at, this, at this point, the apostles are probably not all that equipped to handle, um, you know, if 10,000 <laughs> 10, people would have uh, repented and been baptized that day, maybe they wouldn't have been able to handle that so well. I don't know. Um, the Holy Spirit did what the Holy Spirit did. But here's, here's what you need to see. Peter, we, we, t- we, tend, to, we tend to kind of idealize the apostles. And, and these guys even, you know, I mean, the, the scriptures are very uh, honest and straightforward. These guys made mistakes after this. These guys were, they, they had moments where they were super immature they had moments where they were just made they just made weird kooky decisions in their in their flesh. They weren't perfect. They didn't all of a sudden just become these saints that, you know, had the halos and didn't ever touch the ground anymore. They were normal everyday people. Peter was just like this he was still this fisherman trying to figure out how to follow Jesus on the day of Pentecost and weird things are happening and he's just trying to explain to people what's going on because they're saying we're drunk. He's just trying to say, here's, no, we're not drunk. This is what's happening. This is what God said, and this is what he's doing. And, and it wasn't because he was so smart, or he was, he, it was just because he was willing to open his mouth and speak the words of God in the moment. It really doesn't help us much if we conclude that the Holy Spirit is looking for great leaders to preach great sermons that attract great crowds and then they can be organized into great congregations in order to construct great buildings and exert great leverage in order to control the behavior of a great nation. For some reason in our culture, we have bought into that and it's completely 
That's not in the New Testament. It's not what hap- that's not what's happening in Acts. No one's saying, we just need to take over Rome. No, that is not their, that is not their goal. The Holy Spirit is just simply looking for humble servants who are willing to trust the Lord and share the good news of Jesus' resurrection to anyone who will listen so that salvation would come to their house and the kingdom of God would be advanced and there might be more worshipers in the house of the Lord. This is about the glory of God. And really the key for us in all of this is becoming willing to be used of the Holy Spirit in any moment in order to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus to anyone who will listen. It requires us simply to trust in the Holy Spirit, to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, to speak and act out in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and trust the Holy Spirit for the results. In the whole scheme of things, 3,000 people in one day. I mean, in, in one sense, that's, that's like huge. That'd be awesome, right? In another sense, I think maybe that was one of the smaller days for the church. I wonder how many people in the church on planet Earth are coming to Jesus today. I bet it's more than 3,000. It's God, this is God renewing his acts of power and strength and glory among us today. This is the power of the resurrection at work today. The truth is that if we really want to experience the work of God in and through our own lives, we must choose to cooperate with God in the very way that he is asking. And we must learn to expect God to lead and move and work and speak. He will, in any case, but without an expectant heart, we will neither hear or see or perceive it. We need to expect it. And if we live in expectation that God is moving and that God is working and that God is calling and that he is speaking, then we will hear and see and obey because we're, it's, it's like we're awake to it. He tells us to be awake. Have your shoes tied. Be ready to go at a moment's notice and then we will experience the miracle of Pentecost in our own lives. Then we will see him renew his works in our day through us. And listen, folks, it might not be 3,000. I just, I just want you to know, just get spec- expectations like in the right spot. If you do this, if you say yes, you might not baptize 3,000 on your first day. Don't be disappointed. You might reach one or two. God might use you to save a family in your neighborhood or at work. God might use you to open the eyes of, the bl- of, of a blind person, spiritually blind person that you rub shoulders with all the time. If you will expect him to work. God is still in the business of pouring out his spirit on all flesh. And by the way, that includes you does the question is what are you going to do with it what are you going to do with it would you pray with me
Almighty God, we are so grateful that you are willing to pour out your Spirit on us. We are the ones who were far from you, and, um, and yet you loved us. We were the ones that uh, were your enemies, and you saved us. We were the ones that yelled, crucify him. And you offer us a place in your family. And we are so grateful. And Father, we, uh, we have no reason or right to expect that you would invest your Holy Spirit in us, yet you have. You have filled us with the Spirit of Christ and given us this, this, uh, this amazing mystery of God with us. And Father, we just we give you thanks give you thanks and praise because without it we um, we probably wouldn't even know you God I pray that you would help us to come to that place where we um, where we live with this great expectation that that you are working around us that we would have eyes to see and ears that would hear that we would see people who, who are desiring to move toward you and that we would see your hand upon them and, and that you would put your words in our heart, you would put your words in our mouth, that we might speak boldly the words of life that you have given us to people in a world that is dark and moving toward destruction. Father, I pray that you would, you would give us this... Uh, this sense that even in our normal, mundane, everyday lives, that we would see your hand, your strong, powerful hand, going out among us and doing great and mighty things, that you would renew your works among us in our days. Won't you do this even today, Lord Jesus? And we pray in that precious and holy name.